Today, uh, we are in for a treat from our uh, our friend who has who came here last year, and, uh, and he's coming back, Dr. Roy Clauser. Uh, Dr. Clauser is a professor at the College of New Jersey, professor of philosophy and theology. And he has written uh, some books, and he's brought some books along with uh, with him, and I think he'll introduce some of the books to you, and I highly recommend those for your summer reading. Uh, they, and uh, they're not lightweight, but they are very uh, worthwhile. I just was taking a look through his, uh, his other book that I, that I need to get uh, today. Uh, the title of the talk that he uh, suggested, uh, Is There a Christian View of Everything from Soup to Nuts? That was the uh, original title. Uh, we're, we're switching gears a little bit on you and taking on another topic. But I, I will remind you that the, that the wrestler's class covers everything from soup to nuts. <laughs> and so, in general, I guess the answer is an affirmative. That, yes, we do cover everything in this class. All questions eventually will be answered. So keep with, staying with us, be faithful attendees, and all your questions ultimately will be answered. Uh, and today, we're going to uh, talk about, can you know that God is true? That is the title of this talk, and so you may have seen a, an email sent around about that. I just wanted, since that's the topic, I thought I would uh, read a, a passage from 1 John, the conclusion of, the, of 1 John. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Um, let's uh, open a prayer. And Lord, we do thank you that you have come to us and uh, that you have promised to be present with us uh, as we're here today. We're gathered in your name. We pray that your spirit would guide us and teach us and help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. So, Roy, thank you for coming. <laughs> It's nice to be invited back. Uh, it beats being tarred and feathered. <laughs> uh, the, the switch of, of topic today uh, is to consider can we know that God is real? And if so, how? Now, I have to first make uh, some clarifications. When a philosopher asks, how do you know that? Uh, the philosopher is not asking how you found out. What was the source of your information? That question was given a different sense all the way back as long ago as Plato when he raised this question. And what he means by it and what the philosophers have meant by it ever since is can you be certain of that or is it mere opinion? What is the difference between mere opinion and knowledge? Where knowledge means I'm justified in being certain of this. So if it's my opinion, then it will probably rain later today. Am I certain? Absolutely not. Neither is the weatherman. But then there are other things which I think I am clearly justified in being certain about my name, address, and telephone number, for example, that I had a cup of coffee earlier this morning. Those things seem certain to me, seem certain to me that one and one make two. So the question that Plato raised was, what is the difference between these two sets of beliefs? One set is mere opinion, and we know them to be. Other set, uh, uh, another set is a set of certain truths, truths that are certain, and we're entitled to say they are, but then how do we tell for controversial beliefs whether they belong on the one side or the other? And of course, to you and me, the question is, where does belief in God's reality go? <coughs> is it mere opinion or something of which we are entitled to be certain? Now, <clears throat> there's one answer that some Christians give that we need to get out of the way right up front. Many people, when they are confronted with this sort of question, will answer, 
my belief that God is real, that God is there, that God has made these promises and, and so on, is part of my faith. And I think that that's the wrong answer. And I think that Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that it's the wrong answer. In Hebrews 11, faith, very clearly, is used to mean the same thing that you and I use it to mean in ordinary speech. It means trusting someone to keep a promise. So Hebrews says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever would come to God must believe that he exists. That is, already believe that he exists. You can't come to him if you don't think he's there. And, here comes the faith, that he rewards those who seek him. Now, the rewards haven't happened yet. God hasn't yet raised us from the dead and ushered us into his final kingdom. And the author of Hebrews goes on to say, then, that faith is the grounds on which we believe in what we expect will happen, but hasn't happened yet, and we haven't seen it yet. And the rest of the chapter goes on with example after example after example of somebody trusting a promise that God had made. No Bible writer ever speaks of faith that God is real, but of having faith in God's promises. They have to believe God's real in order to trust Him. So that's not the right answer. We don't believe that God is real because it's something we expect and hope for. No Bible writer ever talks like that. They address all their readers this way. Now you know God's real and you know God's promise this. Are you going to rely on his promise? You going to try to take him at his word and trust him? <clears throat> or do you think this time I can't trust that. I better do this or that's going to zap me. <clears throat> With that out of the way, let me come back to the question. Yes? I, I hate to interrupt you, Go ahead. but we've been reading the Old Testament as a, as a, a church. And it seems to me what you're saying is the reason that God got so angry with the worship of Baal and other beings is that it was, a, it was an example of denying that basic truth yeah. that God, that, that he is, and he is unique. Right, that, that he is God and he alone is He's God. God. Yeah. Exactly. So, so that's what got the, the basic, under, the underlying Absolutely. thing there. Absolutely. This is the most fundamental thing uh, in, in our entire And religion. so he was, everything's based on the fact that, that they were denying that basic underlying right. principle. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's different from somebody who knows the true God and is in covenant relation, but then acts unfaithfully, or can't trust God to be faithful to his promise. That, that's, yeah, that, so that's the challenge. The challenge is to accept as reliable the promises that God has made and rest in them. And often we're tempted not to do it. We, we all fail to do that to some degree or other. I hate to interrupt but, also, but I'll have yes, a question. <laughs> That's good, <laughs> anyway. Uh, I hear you sometimes earlier on in your remarks talking about certainty. Yes. And then justify it in believing it's certain. Yes. Aren't those different? Uh, no. Sometimes people feel certain about something and they're not justified. But uh, the, whether you're justified or not is a matter of opinion, is it not? Oh, no. That's, well, that's what... That's what these philosophers set out to do, to tell us under what conditions are you justified and, uh, and what conditions not. According to whom? <coughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you. Okay, just a moment. That's what we're, that's what we're coming to. Okay. Uh, but, but surely the guy who wakes up and says, I feel lucky today, I'm sure I'm going to win the lottery, is not justified in feeling certain, but he feels certain. Okay, but the, so the question is, how do we sort that out? Now, that leads perfectly into my next point. My next point was... Why I asked. In, <laughs> I'll, I'll pay you off. But I, the, the next point was that the ancient philosophers of our Western intellectual can, tradition came to a consensus about an answer to this. And they came to this consensus 2,300 years ago. 
And the consensus goes like this. You're entitled to be certain of a belief if it is self-evident or proven. Otherwise, not. Okay. Self-evident or proven. Now, that doesn't tell us how to go about finding out whether it, we have an adequate proof and, and so on. But ever since they arrived at that consensus, there has never ceased to be. A, 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 there has been a constant, unending, and widely very torrent of works trying to say what proven means. And it's still with us. But they thought for, that self-evidence is pretty much settled. A belief is self-evident when we don't infer it from anything else. We don't learn it from other premises. For example, I could, if I wish to, I could figure out how much younger I would be now if I had back all the time I spent commuting to the college. I don't want to do that because I'll just get depressed. But I could easily sit down and calculate I live 50 miles from the college, so I have a 100 mile round trip and what that takes and how many times and how a, day, a week and how many years and you know, I can figure that out. I'd probably still be old, but I, that wouldn't be nearly as old. That's an inference. That's, that's a, a, something I would believe on the basis of other facts I would infer that one. But a self-evident truth is one that's not derived from others. I would add this, a self-evident a belief is one that's just produced in us by an experience. So I would say that when we look outside, it's self-evident that the sun is shining. You don't look outside and say, now I see light patches, and I see patches of blue sky, and I see leaves illuminated, so I will draw the conclusion that the sun is out. No, you don't do that at all. You don't draw a conclusion, you just see the sun is out. So when an experience simply produces a belief in us, and we don't infer the belief from anything else, that is, those are two conditions of a self-evident belief, and there are two more. The other two are that the belief that's produced in us is prima facie true. On the, on the face of it, it hits us as true. And the last characteristic is and it hits us as true so that it is irresistibly true. And what I mean by irresistibly true is that we find we cannot disbelieve it. Not that we can't doubt. You can doubt anything. Descartes led everyone astray by asking, what can you doubt and what can you not? That's got nothing to do with it. Because the point is, you can't disbelieve it. So, look, it's self-evident to you and me that we're engaged in this session now. That's prima facie true. It's produced in us by the experience, and it's irresistible. And you think, if you think it's not irresistible, try to get yourself to believe that this isn't happening. Go ahead, try. <laughs> or try to get yourself to believe that it's snowing in here. Or anything else you want to pick. This, that, and I'm going to come back to this point. Beliefs that are self-evident to us are not beliefs we choose. Once you see that one and one is two, that when you experience the class in session, the sun being out, you remember having a cup of coffee. You, you can't choose to, you don't choose those beliefs and you can't choose not to believe them. Choice has nothing to do with it. Self-evidence produces in us a belief. Yeah. I'm trying to relate this to a <clears throat> classroom experience many, many years ago. Question, will the sun rise in the east tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Of course, everybody is inclined to say yes. Next question, would you stake your life on it? We do. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of that as... Right. I'm not challenging anything you're no, saying, no. of course, yeah. but I'm, I'm trying to relate it to that, and if it's pertinent to what you're about to say, could you relate it? Right. Now, um, the classic way of 
of talking about uh, beliefs that are sure and certain is to say that, the, that what we're after is something that is absolutely certain. And I don't think, it, I don't view it that way. Um, I explain in the book that I take things to be absolutely certain or nearly certain, and we treat them alike. So uh, I would say that there are, there's a possibility, there are possibilities that the, something could go wrong with the sun, but they're so, that's such a small percentage that for all practical purposes, it's a certain. And, and we think that, however, not self-evidently, but on the basis of other information we have about the sun and about atomic processes and about the, the structure of the solar system. And so, so that's an inferred belief, not a self-evident one. But inferred beliefs can come awfully close to certain. Yeah. Thank you for the Declaration of Independence. All men are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. Right. And okay. there is at least some discussion now going on that in, in yeah. one culture is done is not taken. Yeah. As okay. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, that's the one quote, the one context from which people have heard the expression self-evident. As soon as I use it, everybody knows about the Declaration. So I have to explain right away that they did not use it correctly and they knew they weren't using it correctly. Right? It doesn't have anything to do with this, this long tradition of distinguishing mere opinion from what you're entitled to be certain about and saying that something is certain if it's self-evident or proven. What Jefferson originally wrote in the Declaration was, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. He was acknowledging that the notion that people are deserving of equal treatment before the law came from the Bible. And Franklin didn't like that. He wanted him to make it sound more like geometry and take away even the slightest allusion to the Christian tradition. So he talked Jefferson into changing it to self-evident. Now, one of the characteristics of a self-evident belief is that it's beyond debate. You can't argue with somebody. If something is self-evident to that person, no matter what arguments you bring up against it, are not going to dissuade the person. So all that meant in this case is not really that it appears true to everybody and that it confers certainty. All it meant was we're not going to debate this. <laughs> That's all. It says, you may not believe this because you're king and you think you're superior to the rest of us, but we say this and we're not going to, we're not, it's beyond discussion. So that was a misuse of, the, of this term. So now, let's go back to this. I had made the point that while there's never ceased to be argument and disagreement about what constitutes a proof for something, whether a belief was self-evident was supposed to be settled, not whether a particular one was, but what it meant for a belief to be self-evident was supposed to be settled, uh, in that it's a belief that we simply experience to be so, that it, it's direct truth recognition on our part. We, we see that it's, that it's so. When I pick this up and I look at these words, it's self-evident to me, these words in front of me in this paper, that kind of thing. And the grand masters of our Western intellectual tradition reflected some more in that and said, well, it's, to, it's a belief produced in you by direct experience. It's not acquired by inferring it from other beliefs. It can yield certainty, not mere opinion. But we're going to put some restrictions on that. Now, before I come to the restrictions, I, wanted, I want you to reflect for a moment on this. If this Western intellectual tradition has it anywhere near right, that is, that you're entitled to be certain if a belief is either self-evident or proven, which would a Christian just naturally want to say about when asked, why are you a Christian? Is, does the, how does the New Testament approach it? Does the New Testament offer proofs to the existence of God? Or does the New Testament talk about self-evidence? Now, self-evidence has always been, that experience has always been described in visual metaphors. People claim that they just see that it's true, that the light dawns, that they had a, a, a light bulb moment, uh, that the, the light shone on this problem. Do you, you follow me? 
Now, the New Testament uses all of that language and never uses any other. Why? How do we know that God is true? Because the Holy Spirit has removed the blindness of our heart and the light of the gospel has shined in. St. Paul even has the best expression for self-evidence I've ever read. That you see with the eyes of your mind the truth. Right. Yeah, but there's one big part here where I think Christianity leaves what you're saying right at the very beginning. Because Christianity doesn't take its truths from the Greek intellectual tradition, but from the Hebrew. Yeah. And the proof, is, I put that word in quotes, evidence of the existence of God is God's action in history, beginning with his action with the Hebrew people, which is evidence in the Old Testament. Right. And so when you say, well, will God keep his promises? Yes, that's an open question. But you look back and you see God has kept his promises. Okay. In the past. So there's the, there's the whole testament of history that Christianity is based on. The, the question that I'm pointing to and that I'm trying to raise is one that underlies that. It's, a, it's another step deeper. It, and it could be asked this way at the Sunday school child's question. How did Abraham know it was God talking to him? How did Moses know it was God? That's what I'm asking. I'm asking about how we can be sure of God's reality. It's not a question, did people think they contacted God? Yes. Do we have a tradition about what God is supposed to have said? Yes. How do we know it was God? Is it clearer? I'm, I'm aiming at something... God, because of what God said and did. But do you, how do you know it was God that said and did it? That's the question. You can't. Oh, I think you can. Okay. So, <laughs> now, okay, so that's, that's where we're going. That's what we're going for. Now, it's interesting when you talk about the Hebrew background to this as opposed to the Greek background, is that both regard certain truths as simply obvious or uh, matters of enlightenment. Right? The prophets talk this way, too about the light shining in our, in our hearts. In your light we see light. Your light is truth. Right? So, it, in fact, this question about mere opinion and knowledge isn't just raised in the West and isn't just raised by philosophers. Everybody knows there's a difference. The, the simplest person in the, in the crudest tribe on Earth knows there's a difference between mere opinion and what you're entitled to be certain of. And the experience of self-evidence is a universal human experience. We experience some things to be prima facie and irresistibly true. And it doesn't matter whether we're Hebrews or Greeks or, or what. So I'm, I'm asking you to think about this. Why, when Christianity arose and Christians were confronted with the question, how do you know that's the right God? How do you know that God exists? How do you know that that God spoke to Moses and the prophets? and said Jesus. How do you know that God's real at all? We would have expected them to say, it's self-evident to us that the gospel is the truth about God from God. And they didn't do it. There, I don't know, I'm not saying nobody ever did it, I'm going to read you two people who did do it and did it brilliantly. I'm going to read quotes from them in a moment. But the vast majority of Christian thinkers, apologetes, theologians, and so on, did not say that. Instead, they tried to construct proofs of the existence of God. There are three proofs in St. Augustine. St. Anselm was famous for his ontological proof of the existence of God. St. Thomas Aquinas offered five proofs of the existence of God. Descartes, Leibniz, offered proofs of the existence of God. In the late 1700s, early 1800s, a man named Paley gave a design argument for the existence of God. We've had a long parade of these proofs. So, let me, I have these three things. Can we know God is real? Are we entitled to be certain of that? Do we know it by faith? I'm saying, um, the New Testament's use of the word faith, the answer to that is no. That's not part of, that's not something we trust will be so. It's something we can know. Is it self-evident or done or known by proof? Now, I, there are two reasons that I'm opposed to all 
every and all proofs of God. One is that we're assured by the New Testament that no such proof can possibly be effective. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, Humans, as they're naturally born, receive not the things of God, neither can they know them. They do not have the ability to know them. They seem foolish to them instead. So you can go and offer all the proofs you want, and it was not, will never persuade somebody who doesn't already believe in God. Now, if you feel like making them for fun, that's another question. But they're not going to be effective. I have a second reason, and this is more serious. The fundamental thing that we are told about God is that the, the name God is the name for that being which is the self-existent origin of everything else. That's a quote from Calvin. So that ought to be permissible. <laughs> the self-existent origin of everything else. He says, that which is the origin of all else must necessarily be self-existent and eternal. That's in the Institutes. I think that's exactly right. Now, if God is, in fact, the creator of everything other than himself, and that includes everything about the universe, everything to be found in the cosmos, or as Colossians puts it, everything, whether visible or invisible, that for a second because everything is visible or invisible <laughs> okay then it's got to include the laws of logic and mathematics which are the laws of proof if God is the creator of the laws of proof and those laws rule govern all creatures creatures are subject to those laws what happens when you create a proof of God is that you subject God to those laws and you thereby demote God from being the creator of them to being one more creature governed by them. Your project may have a laudable motive, but it's actually an insult to God. If God is the creator of the laws of proof, then whatever can be proven would thereby not be God. Whatever can be proven by use of those laws is not the creator of those laws who is not subject to them. That's also, Calvin doesn't put that point quite that way, but he puts it somewhat close. This way, God is above all laws. Don't do this whole thing. The whole pack seems to be wrong because what I know of Scripture is God introduces Himself or He reminds people and is experiential. I am the God of your fathers, yes, who fought for us out of Egypt, and He wants a relationship. He's not looking for a syllogism. That's right. He wants a human response. That's right. And what what I'm now asking about is whether we have the right to be confident that those experiences, in fact, show us the truth. Well, that's the question we have to, because it's not just a relationship with God. How can you how can you get married if you don't have faith? I mean, how can you have any friendships without yes. trust that the person right. you are interacting with would act? You have to would have to believe that, that, that person's real to have a relationship. Right, it's a relationship. Right. It's not it's not a philosophical okay. structure. So now I'm going through these three possible sources of knowledge of God. Is it that we don't have knowledge, but we just trust that God's there? I say that's not biblical. No. That's not the biblical use of the term faith. Is it proof? No, because the New Testament already tells us that no proof will be effective for grounding a belief. The natural man's not going to receive the things of God. He has the ability to do it. And, and what's worse, constructing such a proof assumes that God is subject to the same laws we are, which demotes him from being the creator to being one more creature subject to those laws. So I would have thought that in the light, light of all this, and these things have been pointed out by many writers before me, that what early Christians would have said is, it's self-evident to us because the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, removing the blindness of our hearts, 
it's self-evident that the gospel is the truth about God from God. Why didn't they do it? And there's a very clear answer. The clear answer is that the Western intellectual tradition not only recognized, had to recognize the experience of self-evidence, because everybody has it, but they then put restrictions on it. They said, now, you may have an experience of self-evidence, but that experience is genuine only if it meets these three criteria. These are the, the Grand Master speaking from the top of Olympus, telling us, please, what's allowed to count. Two of the restrictions were put on self-evidence by Aristotle, who died about 2,300 years ago. Aristotle says it's a genuine experience, a, a truth is genuinely self-evident, only if it's a law. Only laws, only necessary truths can be self-evident. And when you have self-evident knowledge of a necessary truth, of a law, it's infallible. See, it, so to be genuinely self-evident, a belief has to be about a law and it has to be an infallible truth. Now, he's asked at one point, well, will everyone recognize these? And he says, well, maybe not everybody. I mean, most, most self-evident truths will be obvious to most people, but there are some that might be obvious only to experts. That gets changed by René Descartes place him in time. Descartes died in 1650. Descartes democratizes this like crazy. No. If a truth is self-evident, everybody who understands it will see it to be so. And he adds, everyone who is in the least degree rational. So provided you're not a total loony, or you're not an infant, or totally senile, or whatever, if the truth is self-evident and you understand it, you will see it to be self-evident. So now we've got three restrictions. And listen, the last one, the everybody requirement, became so entrenched in Western thought that by the 20th century it became the very definition of self-evidence. A self-evident truth, oh, that's the truth that everybody sees to be true once they understand it. They took that as the definition. Now those three restrictions are what have prevented Christians from saying to unbelievers, I know that that came from God, because it's self-evident to me that this comes from God. It's why they offered proofs instead of saying, if the Holy Spirit removed the blinds of your heart, you'd believe it too. And until he does, you won't. Now, what I'm offering you today is something that hasn't happened in 2,300 years. In 2,300 years, nobody ever sat down and said, well, let's examine these three restrictions and see whether they're any good. Do you believe that? It's hard to believe, isn't it? Do you know that in the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, there isn't even an entry under self-evidence? Everybody just accepts it. Mind you, there have here and there, there have been epistemologists who have said, I don't go along with the infallibility or I don't go along with one or another of these. But nobody ever took all three and said, you know what? All three of these, I, I asked if I was allowed to use the word crap. All three of these never had a good reason for them at all, and they stink. And that's what I'm going to give you. Would you write them on the whiteboard yes, sure. so we can keep track of them? Sure. Here's, here are the three restrictions on self-evidence. Whoops. That didn't come out too well. I'm try this again. Everybody must agree. Self-evidence attaches only necessary truths. This would be one and one is two. Things equal to the same thing or equal to each other. All bachelors are unmarried. Whatever is a, a law. <laughs> And they have to be infallible. Now let's take these one at a time, and I'll explain to you why there is no good reason to think that any one of them is true, and tons of good reasons to think that they're false. Uh, it seems to me when you read uh, 
the New Testament, especially the book of Acts. I mean, the early disciples went out and gave proof for the, the truth of the Christian Christianity. They, they said they were eyewitnesses to the risen Lord. They had seen the Lord alive. So I think, um, I think uh, we have innate knowledge of God. But as far as the truth of Christianity, I think uh, the disciples gave a lot of proof for the truth, and it's a very empirical. Okay, religion. thank you for that clarification, because I, I should make that, and it's good one. I mean, you have to just, I mean, Muslims would say, yeah, I believe in God, but I mean, as Christians, right. if we're going to go out and witness, we have to. Right. So the, the, question there, proof. If, the question there isn't whether God's real. The, the Christians were speaking to fellow Jews who also believed in the reality of God, and the proofs were that Jesus was his Messiah. And there you can point to the resurrection and this and that. Yeah, that that's great. But that's not questioning whether God's real at all and how you know it. So that part's true. And I think that's the same thing that uh, the way you, it must be understood when, when Peter says, have, uh, answer, have a, an answer ready for every man who asks about the hope that is within you. Well, the hope always refers to the resurrection. Why do you believe you're going to be raised? And the answer is because Jesus was. It doesn't have to do with an abstruse metaphysical proof that God's real. Right. So again, uh, I'm still dealing at a level that's prior to that. It's how do we know God's real at all? All right, now, I want to read to you from two thinkers who recognize the New Testament answer. It amounts to saying that it's self-evident. The first is one that again should be familiar to you. It's from John Calvin. As to the question, how shall we be persuaded that scripture came from God? It's just the same as if we were asked, how shall we learn to distinguish light from darkness, white from black, sweet from bitter? Scripture bears upon the face of it as clear evidence of its truth as white and black do of their color, sweet and bitter of their taste. And you hear there the prima facie truth. He goes on. Unbelieving men think that religion rests only on opinion. And therefore, that they may not believe, so that they may not believe anything foolishly or on slight grounds, they desire and insist to have it proved by reason that Moses and the prophets were divinely inspired. But I answer that the testimony of the Spirit is superior to reason. Scripture carrying its own evidence along with it deigns not to submit to proofs and arguments, but owes the full conviction with which we ought to receive it to the testimony of the Spirit of God. Such, then, is a conviction that asks not for reasons, it's a knowledge which accords with the highest reason, namely knowledge in which the mind rests more securely than giving reasons. I say nothing more than what every believer experiences in himself, though my words fall short of the reality. Now that captures precisely what I've been trying to say. And you might think, maybe you think, well, you did this good job, but Calvin did. Okay, fine. But this is the point. It bears on the face of it. It carries its own evidence. It's self-evident. It is, we experience it as true. And that's how we know that God's real. The scripture comes from God. Now I'll come back to clarify that some more. I don't think any of us experience everything in scripture that way. But what happens is that when people are confronted with the gospel, some cluster of beliefs is self-evident to them, and it's self-evident that it comes from God. And that cluster differs from person to person, and that cluster expands over the life of our, our walk with God. Now, here's another thinker who says the same thing, and he uses very different terms, but it's the same point. And this is from Pascal. We know truth not only by means of reasoning, but also by the heart. And it is in this last way that we know first principles, the fundamental axioms. And he's thinking of science. Listen to this. Reason has no part in this and tries in vain to refute them. What's self-evident to you 
You can't cast doubt on for a person by giving them arguments. You may not know how to answer the argument, but what's self-evident is still self-evident. For example, the knowledge of first principles, such as those of space, time, movement, and number, are as sure as anything we can get by reasoning. And reason must trust these intuitions of the heart and base all its reasoning upon them. End of the paragraph. Therefore, those to whom God has imparted religion by intuition are very fortunate and justly convinced. That's sufficient to justify their belief. Now, they have different ways of expressing the same thing. Calvin likens it to perception, Pascal to axioms, but the point is that in each case something is directly experienced as prima facie true and irresistibly true, and that's the ground on which it's believed. And each say that that's how we know that God spoke through scripture. It's why Pascal adds to this, no doubt thinking of 1 Corinthians 2.14 To those who believe, no proof is necessary. To those who do not, no proof is possible. But what about the three restrictions? What about the fact that, according to the Western intellectual tradition, we're not allowed to say that it's self-evident to us that God speaks in Scripture. We're not allowed to give the Sunday school kid, the answer, how did Abraham know it was God? It was self-evident to him that that was God. Why are we not allowed to do that? Well, because not everybody agrees with us. And because what we're claiming to know self-evidently isn't the law. God's real isn't the law. It's a statement of fact. And because we can't claim to know it infallibly, and the reason we can't claim to know it infallibly is that not everybody agrees with it, so somebody's got to be wrong. So here's what I'm asking you to do this morning. Since <coughs> everything is knowledge, we're entitled to be certain of it, if and only if it's either self-evident or proven, Let's ask about the three restrictions, whether they're self-evident or proven. <laughs> Does that sound fair? I mean, they can't be exceptions. So let's ask about them. Let's start with the everybody requirement. For a, a truth to be genuinely self-evident truth, everybody must see it. Now, why should I think that's so? Does it have proof? And the interesting thing about it is that it not only doesn't have any, it can't have any. Because everybody in that formula means every person that ever did, is now, or ever will live. It would be hard enough to find that out for everybody living. We'd have to canvas six billion people. But we can't canvas the dead, and we certainly can't canvas the unborn. And we have no way to know them that anything meets this. Right, so, if you can't know for any truth whatever that everybody believed it, you can't know that it must be that everybody believes it for it to be self-evident. So, what about this restriction itself being self-evident? If it has no proof, can, it, can somebody say, well, it's just self-evident to me that uh, well, everybody would have to believe, to agree with the truth for it to count? And the answer is, nope, you can't do that because it's not self-evident to me, and therefore it fails its own requirement. See, everybody would have to agree with it, too, for it to be self-evident. And since I don't and others I know don't, it's not self-evident. Yes? Well, it seems like um, uh, a, a spurious uh, requirement on everybody. Uh, you, when you talk about the unborn and... Uh, of course. And, uh, they, uh, wouldn't it be reasonable to say that everybody who has encountered this concept believes it? Well, it means everybody who ever understood it. Right. 
but you can't, still can't canvass the dead and the unborn to find <coughs> out everybody who ever understood it or ever will will find it to be true. Oh, that seems to me like a, uh, a useless uh, uh, re requirement to impose. But <laughs> okay. That, you know, the people who right. haven't encountered this thing, believe it or not. No, it's not whether people who haven't, haven't encountered it. It's people who did encounter it in the past, <coughs> who did encounter it in the present, and who will encounter it in the future, will they all see that it's true? Well, there's no way to know. Because you just can't ask them. Yeah. So the everybody requirement, it turns out, has no proof. Not only has no proof, it can't have any. And it's not self-evident because it fails its own requirement because not everybody sees it to be true. So let's go to the next one. Is it true that for a a belief to count as self-evidently certain, it has to be a law. Well, it's been 2,300 years since Aristotle proposed that. Um, but you know what? We're going to cover all the arguments given in favor of it in a half a second. In 2,300 years, nobody ever even tried to give a proof of that because nobody can think of what a proof of that would look like. What premises would you deduce the conclusion all self, genuinely self-evident truths have to be laws? How would you derive that? What truths would be more basic that would yield that? So the question is, it's, it has no proof. Is it self-evident? And the answer is no, because it itself isn't a necessary truth. It also fails its own requirement. The everybody requirement turned out to be something not everybody agrees with. This requirement says only necessary truths can be self-evident, but it's not a necessary truth. Now let me explain to you. I'll try this. And if, it, if you don't get this, let it go. We'll go to the next one. Okay. Here's the way we're supposed to test whether a truth is a necessary truth. A truth is a necessary truth when, when you deny it, you have to contradict yourself. So here's an example of one. All bachelors are unmarried. What's the denial of that? The denial of that is there's at least one bachelor who is married. Is that self-contradictory? Sure it is. A married bachelor is self-contradictory. <laughs> yes? Therefore, all bachelors are unmarried is a necessary truth. Now try the same thing with this. The denial of this requirement says there's at least one necessary, there's at least one self-evident truth that isn't the law. Does that contradict itself the way a married bachelor contradicts itself? Not the least. It doesn't come within my In fact, it's self-evident to you right now that we're having this conversation, that there's a chair under your butt, that there's a sun out outside. And none of those things are laws, and none of them have self-contradictory you notice. Know? The conclusion is that the second restriction is also neither proven nor self-evident. What about the third? The third says that to be genuinely self-evident, the belief has to be infallible. Now, be careful about this. There's a difference between certainty and infallibility. You and I are certain that we are now engaged in this class. What infallible means there's no possible way we could be wrong that we arrive at that belief by some capacity of ours that can <coughs> never make a mistake. Well, how do we know that the class is going on? We see other people, we hear them talk, we shake hands and feel their hands, we, uh, right? By sensory perception. But, Sensory perception is an infallible, right? People do have hallucinations, they have dreams, they sometimes missee something. Um, we do not know that the class is in session by capacities of ours that can never make a mistake. But that's exactly what was claimed for the experience of self-evidency by Aristotle and by Descartes. Descartes says, when you know something by intuition, it cannot possibly be false. But there's nothing about us that's like that. There's nothing about us that's infallible. Help. I just got to remark on this. That, that I think a consistent thing in Scripture is 
we can know enough to be saved, but there are always mysteries. Paul alludes to things that were revealed to him he could not, he sure. could wanting to put down in an epistle. Our knowledge of God is imperfect. There are mysteries. God well, can break his own laws. So there's got to be a sense of wonder about that which we cannot know fully in at least our present exactly. circumstances. Exactly so. Yes? Yes, but wouldn't you say that self-evidence, and I, I'm, I'm just going to follow the thinking here that you've given us already, yeah. is always um, increased by experience. Yes, it's based on experience, and, it, and, and what we experience to be self-evident can increase. And, and, and then that's where the confidence, the other things go right. into that. That's right. That's right. That's right. confidence in God. Exactly. That trust in exactly. God. It grows. Relationship. How do I say I love grows. God? Yes. That all comes with the experience. Exactly. And so my self-evidence right. is strengthened that's right. by the experience that's of right. God. Okay. I, in fact, one of the points that I wanted to make about infallibility, against infallibility, is precisely that though humans, all humans, everywhere and always, have experienced things to be self-evidently true, they always test that. They ask other people, do you see it? Uh, they test it against other beliefs that they have, um, and, and so on. It's a kind of uh, recognition of an innate sense of our own fallibility, that we're not infallible, that we can make a mistake about almost anything. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, there's something else about this that I'll just toss out for you to think about for a second, and then I'll get your... Oh, okay. Is that okay? Sure. Uh, infallibility is, is, to my mind, is a scary thing that should wait red flags for Christians a long time ago. Uh, we're told in Genesis, that the fall and the sin came about when our ancestors caved to the temptation to want to be like God. Temptation wasn't just eating fruit. The temptation was, oh, God doesn't want you to eat that because he knows that when you do, you'll be like him, and you'll know good and evil the way they really are. Um, that desire to be infallible has uh, very scary connotations or should. Um, there is no capacity of ours that just can't be mistaken. And I have, there are some other arguments that will show that, uh, which I probably shouldn't go into. I should probably leave more time for questions at the end. But, um, you know, for, for a, to show that a belief isn't infallible, all you have to show is that it's possible that it be false, no matter how true it seems. Well, for any belief we have, we can always think of a possible circumstance that we, under which it would be false. And some of these are crazy stuff, but if you can think of it, it, it shoots down the claim. So one is that there are Alpha Centurions circling uh, the Earth right now in a spaceship, and they're beaming us with tachyon waves. And those are affecting our brains so that we see and experience this class, but it's not really going on, and they're up there laughing their butts off. Okay, the, if, if the, see, that's a possible circumstance that would make it our self-evidence uh, of this class false. So it's not fallible. Right? It doesn't have to be true. It just has to be that if you can think of any circumstance under which something could be false, then it's not fallible. Well, then nothing is. So my point here is that after 2,300 years of getting away with this stuff, of putting it over on Christians that you can't come back and answer us that you know this because the Holy Spirit took the blindness away from your heart. I mean, that's a circular argument. That, right? God, if God's real, you want to know how God's real, and you say because God took the blindness away from us, oh, that already assumes God's real. That's right. It's not an argument. This is a description of our experience, as Calvin says, what every believer experiences in himself, of the witness, the testimony of the Holy Spirit, the blindness is removed, God speaks to us from his word, it's self-evident to us that the gospel is the truth that comes from God about God. And there's not a reason in the world not to say that anymore. Because those three restrictions have been destroyed. There is no recovery for them. They have no proof 
they fail their own requirements for self-evidence. And not only does the everybody requirement fail its own requirement, the necessity and the infallibility, but each one of them fails the others. worst conceptual messes that has ever been foisted off onto any intellectual tradition and gotten away with it for 2,000 years. It's time to call it dead and bury it. I'm willing to accept what you just said as an argument, but when you get into the, or part of it, what you're saying about the intellectual problem, but if, when you say, which I think you have, that this is something that has intimidated, prevented Christians for all these years. That's an historical statement. Yes, sir. But you don't have historical evidence for that. Oh, sure. Uh, sh sh shall I give you, I'll give you one prime example? One prime example is not enough. <laughs> well, We're talking about how many hundreds do you want? of thousands of people over many how many, how many examples do you want? Well, you have to have massive historical evidence for that. Okay. I think that can be adduced, but I haven't got the time. Uh, the example I was thinking of is Thomas Aquinas. In the Summa Theologica, Thomas asks, raises the question, is it self-evident that God exists? And he answers, no. He says that there are, um, part of his answer I don't like this answer, but I'm going to tell you what his answer is. Uh, a state, a belief can be self-evident in itself or to someone. That, I don't like that either. And it might be that God's existence is self-evident in itself, but it isn't to us. Therefore, it needs proof, and he goes on to give five proofs. And that's not an uninfluential example. <laughs> I mean, that has dominated the whole discussion, at least since Aquinas. Well, the Roman Catholic discussion, not the Protestant. But oh, I, I, let me say one other thing here. Unfortunately, I, it's dominated both. I'm, no, it hasn't. But, but one other thing here is that <laughs> it makes me wonder whether, I mean, I, whether you make a big thing about how this self-evidence is so important yeah. that we ought to be able to say it. But I really wonder if that is true, and I'll defer to Howard here, because I think that on the basis of what Howard said before about relationships, what we see them in the Bible, what you see in the church century after century, the relationship of people with each other, trusting others' experience, and the relationship with God, that this is infinitely more important than any question of whether you can say God is self-evident, that that's relatively insignificant. Um, I think uh, then that we just don't see that in light. I think it's exactly the reverse. I think that what Howard's pointing at is based on already knowing that God is real and trusting his promises, and then believers mutually interact with one another in encouraging their faith and sharing their stories of God's faithfulness. And all of that increases our faith, our trust, and our reliance in God but I'm still at a, uh, I'm dealing here at a level that's one step below that. Is God real at all? Is there a God to be faithful to? And who's faithful to us? How do we know that? And surely that's what Calvin addressed too. And Pascal, how do we know that? And they both say it's as evident as the difference between white and black, sweet and bitter axioms. It's a fundamental truth that's known uh, Pascal says, calls it intuition. Many, many uh, writers have called self-evidency uh, an intuition, an experience of direct experience. truth recognition. It's experiential. It's experiential. I know God. God spoke to me this morning. That's way. right. And if somebody says, but that's, you know, that was, uh, remember what uh, Marley's ghost, uh, Scrooge <coughs> says to Marley's ghost, I don't know if you're real. You could be a spot of mustard, a bit of undigested <laughs> potato. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what people try to do. And so they'll try anyway to dismiss that experience, the experiential claim. But the point is that the New Testament is very clear. We know God by experiencing God. In well, the classic cases, I think Saul of Damascus, the guy who really knew where he was theologically, yeah. was absolutely wrong. 
But we, the, the great thing, the mystery in Scripture is we don't know what happens after Damascus. Paul disappears for about two or three years, but he's transformed when he reappears because he's been interacting with people who have faith. Right. Now, if if Paul were asked, uh, how do you know that was really Jesus and not just uh, you having an epileptic fit or something like that? I think that's that he'd give us an answer awfully close to this. He knew something big and important. That, that the Spirit of God, God reached out had for removed the blindness of his heart and allowed him to see the truth. Right. And that, that was as self-evident as one right. minus two. Right. And that's what I'm saying about this. Putting the belief that God is real on this basis, it puts it on the same basis on which we believe one and one is two. There are objects around us. There are laws of nature. There are all kinds of beliefs that are self-evident and can't be known any other way. Belief in God is one. But it's not the only one. What you're saying is about 85% of philosophers are the hound dogs chasing the wrong rabbits. That's right. In fact, in recent years, it's become more than that. What, what has happened, just an historical aside, what has happened in philosophy is that people have taken this stuff very seriously, and especially ever since Descartes, ever since the rise of modern philosophy. They've tried very hard to offer proofs for all the things that this ruled out as self-evident. For example, that there are objects around us. How do you know there are objects around you? Well, it's not self-evident, according to this. Because anybody understanding that statement should be able to see, you, and understanding the statement, there's a chair here, should be able to see that it's true. It's self-evident. Call somebody up on the phone in Tokyo and say, there's a, there's a chair here. Do they know that's true? No. Therefore, no beliefs about sense perceptions are self-evident. So we've had 450 years of people trying to prove there are objects outside of us. And every one of those proofs has failed miserably. How do you know there are laws of nature? If it's not self-evident, are there proofs? People have tried again and again and again, and no proof works. Do other people have minds? It's not allowed to be self-evident. It fails the everybody requirement. It's not, a, it's not a law, and it's not infallible. So there have been proof after proof, argument after argument, trying to show that other people really have minds, and they all fail. And so what has happened at the end of the 20th century and into the beginning of the 21st century is that the, the predominant view in epistemology has come to be what's called pragmatism. And I'm going to quote one of the major pragmatists of the, who just died last year, Richard Vorty. We believe what we do because we think it will make us happier than we'd otherwise be. We can't know that anything is true. All of our beliefs are adopted by us because we think that they'll make us happier to do so. <laughs> you know, it did not make me happier than I would otherwise be so to get the report that my wife had cancer. And if he thinks that that's all there is to it, I want to see him drink the sulfuric acid. Right? There's no statement, he says, no statement corresponds to reality at all. Notice that that statement is supposed to correspond to reality. <laughs> but, well, I, I remember this from high school chemistry. Poor little Joey, for Joey is no more. For what he thought was H2O was H2SO4. <laughs> if, if he really thinks that all that is just whatever we want it to be, then let's see him drink it. That's, that's, where, that's where we've ended up, in the dump called postmodernism, where everything is equally true and equally false. You want to believe God made a covenant with Abraham and Christ, and God is, Christ is God incarnate? Go right ahead. That's fine. But it's not... It's not true to the exclusion of anything else. That's true for you. That just means you're entitled to hold it because everybody's entitled to hold any bloody thing they wish because nobody knows what truth is at all. That's certainly not New Testament, is it? Paul? Well, yeah, I think you brought up some philosophers. Let me, I, I think there may be a, a dilemma here that may okay. explain part of why the recent history of philosophy is going this way. Because, you know, what the Kant said that Hume woke him from his dogmatic slumbers. And I think what, you know, what your argument 
how do you distinguish it from just dogmatism? And I think that's part of the challenge that we're talking about here. You're just making a claim. To, to someone who's not a believer, you're just making a claim without any grounds. Uh, so how do you deal with it? In other words, medieval thought, uh, pre-enlightenment thought. How do you, how do you answer that? The, there is an element of dogmatism in something. When someone says, uh, why do you hold that? Um, that's self-evident to me. Uh, then that's kind of um, a discussion stopper. <laughs> it's, if it's self-evident to you, well then, you know, what can I say? I can certainly raise against someone objections. Then how would you handle this? What would you say about that? In order to find out more about how that's applied more broadly. But the fact is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and this gets me you know, brought into a, something broader than this topic this morning. The fact is, uh, I would argue, and, I, and, I, and this occurs in, in my book in, the con in, the, in this wider context, I would argue that everyone holds some religious belief or other. Everyone regards something or other as divine. Let me, d let me define that for you. I'm using exactly the definition that Calvin gave. The self-existent reality on which everything else depends. What is that? Every religion is focused on identifying the self-existent reality on which everything else depends. And every religion agrees that that's what it means to be divine. They don't agree on who or what is divine, but they all agree on that's what, what they mean. Just as we all agree on what it means to be president, even if there's a close election and we disagree about who won. Okay. Now, in, when it comes to that, this point about divinity beliefs, my contention is that everybody holds their divinity belief because it's self-evident to them. The materialist who insists that it's matter and energy does so because that looks right to him. I'll quote one of them to you. This is a, an analytic philosopher from the end of the 20th century, and I heard his, his, he was lecturing on a theory of language. And he concluded this way. His name is Paul Ziff, if you want to know who that was. Now, you might ask, is this theory of language materialist or idealist? He said, it seems to me it's neutral in the sense that you could adapt it either way. You'd have to take one, some interpretation of it, but it could be adapted. If you ask me which I am, and then he started talking to himself. If you ask me what I am, I'd have to say I'm a materialist. It's hard to say why. It's not because of the arguments. I guess I just have to say reality looks irresistibly physical to me. Now, isn't that awfully close to what Calvin said about how we know scripture comes from God? He's admitting that it's self-evident. Let me put the same point a slightly different way in the light of what I've quoted to you from the New Testament. And here's a kind of 21st century way of rephrasing it. God has created us, created the world for us and us for himself. And part of that is that God has built into human nature self-evidency antennae that pick up self-evident truths. It's self-evident to everyone that one and one makes two, that there's a difference between red and green, that it's wrong to steal. But humans also have a built-in self-evidency antennae when it comes to what's divine. But it fell. It's not in proper working order. So while everybody picks up that something's divine, as they naturally come into the world, they pick up the wrong thing is divine. Paul describes it in Romans 1 this way, that because of the fall, their foolish hearts became darkened. They turned the truth about God into a lie and worship and serve something God created instead of the creator. <coughs> so my reply, uh, my response, Paul, in the end would be, but everybody comes back to the same point and is dogmatic in the same way and confronts people with different intuitions of self-evidency concerning what is divine. And it helps us to know that that's what's going on in an unbeliever. It helps us to know because we may even, that person, him or herself, may not be aware of what he has put in that slot in the place of God. It may be subconscious. And we can could in discussion help ferret that out. They can come to see for themselves what they regard as the, as the divine origin of everything else. And then we would know how to address that. 
And it's also why, in, in this book, I lay all of this out. I critique these three restrictions on self-evidence, and I compare belief in the gospel to belief in the axiom of equals, and find that whatever's an objection to one is an objection to the other, and whatever can be said in favor of one can be said in favor of the other. And, and uh, in the end, uh, I asked the guy to make an experiment. I don't have an argument. I don't have a proof. I'm not going to defeat him in intellectual battle. Make an experiment. Find out for yourself. The experiment is try reading the scripture. Say the Gospel of John. But you have to do it in, in, with the proper attitude. The proper attitude is it might be true. Right? Your self evidence the intuition isn't mine. Mine isn't yours. But here's a way to find out. Put yourself in a position to have that experience. Now, if he says no, then there's nothing you can do. No, why not? Isn't it even possible that it's right? Then that he's got to give proofs that it isn't possible. He can't do it. So, okay, so you say, make the experiment of reading the scripture. Before you read, say out loud, God, if you're really there, show me. In conjunction with that, attend worship of some Christian group. Observe. As an observer, you have to see people grappling with this in their everyday lives and trying to put it into, into practice. And, and, and failing in you know all the, all of the fallibility and, uh, and foibles that he'll encounter, but see it in practice. But you have to read it in a certain way. You don't read it looking for a system of philosophy. You don't read it looking for a system of theology. You don't really look at it as a theory. You read it to see if you hear God speak to you, because Scripture contains information, no doubt. And that's what we grapple with and try to systematize when we do theologies. But it's not just that. It's there we meet God. There God speaks to us. When something, some teaching, become, it becomes self-evident that that's God, the truth about God from God, then God has spoken to us and we have experienced God. That's not the only way we experience God, but that way is common to all Christians. And I asked the guy in the interlocutor, it's a dialogue, I asked him to make that experiment. He says, well, I'm not sure. Maybe. <laughs> but, but that's what I would ask anybody to do. Put yourself in the, in the position of having experience. Consider the analogy. The analogy is that you're teaching geometry, and you have a kid in the class, and you, you mention the axiom, things equal the same thing or equal to each other. And the kid says, I don't see that. It doesn't look right to me. What would you say? There's no proof of it. But you might say, stick around, do geometry, see it apply, see if what, what can't be done if we don't have it, blah, 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 blah. And maybe he'll have the experience of seeing it, maybe he won't. But you can't force it on him. But that's the way the New Testament presents the gospel. You must see it to be true for yourself. You're not taking it on the say-so of anybody else. We're grateful to the people that wrote the scripture. We're grateful to the saints of the past who have written and talked about God's faithfulness. But that's not why we believe God's real. Right? I don't believe the axiom of equals because my geometry teacher told it to me. I'm grateful she's the one that passed it on. But it's self-evident to me. That's why I believe it. Just a quick one at this point. So what is so astounding and exciting is that God meets everybody where they are. Yeah. And St. Louis has this very intellectual acceptance of the equality of God, but he says the light and the power and the love does not flow in until later. That's who he was. He was an academic. I can understand the guy. That's where God meets him. God meets every person at the point of your own pain. That's right. That's why there's no one apologetic method for approaching any unbeliever. You don't know what it is they put into the place of God. You don't know their present life circumstances and what they're grappling with themselves. You can't know that. You leave that to the Spirit. You say, make this experiment. Read the Gospel and see if God speaks to you. If He does, then you'll know, you'll believe too, and you'll know why we do. And you notice that now I'm coming back full circle, and I'll shut up after this, I promise. <laughs> I said to you that. that Beliefs that are acquired because of self-evidence are not choices. You remember that? We don't have volitional control over them. We can't alter them. And that's what the gospel says about itself, doesn't it? We don't choose that belief. 
Christ says over and over, the disciples come to him and say, how come they didn't believe? Because they can't, is his answer. I know this is it's popular with radio and television evangelists to say that you've got to choose to accept Christ or something. The New Testament writers don't write like that. They talk about God choosing us. It's not a choice. Okay, we're out of time. Right. This is just starting to get really, really